Hi, welcome to the GLBT History Museum. My name is Mark Vishke and I'm the co-curator with Melissa Hawkins of Soma Nights, um, which is a photographic exhibit of Melissa's um, work uh, in queer nightlife from 1986 to 1994. I'm a nightlife historian, a former member of the GLBT Historical Society Board, and I'm also the editor of website 48hills.org that covers news and culture. My name is Melissa Hawkins, and I am the photographer. Uh, this body of work came from working with the Sentinel newspaper. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer being published. Um, there was a man named Mike Everett that I worked with at the time, and he was the one that I traveled around with from club to club, and that's how this body of work was created. This is the uh, GLBT uh, History Museum's first exhibit of a living artist. So we're very honored to have Melissa's work here and honored to still have Melissa with us here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, Melissa actually approached the museum um, because she had been looking over some of her work that had been stored underneath her bed and um, wondering if the museum would want to do something with this tremendous uh, body of work about queer history that's so important to us in San Francisco. I first got into photography in middle school and I had such a wonderful teacher, Larry Kilgore, that, uh, I mean, it just became an absolute passion of mine. And he's the voice with the sage advice to never get rid of my negatives. So I'm really glad that he said that when he did. Uh, from there, I was certainly involved with photography in high school. I was always on the newspaper staff and the yearbook staff and just doing as much photography as I could possibly muster. And then um, I went to college and studied photojournalism for a little while and then left that and went to art school for a bit. Uh, I, then I came out to San Francisco and proceeded to uh, get involved in the lab scene, a lot of black and white photography labs that were uh, plentiful. And I would do that during the day and uh, work with the Sentinel at night. So it was a, it was a busy life. I studied art at um, the Colorado Institute of Art in Denver. I didn't finish there, and then when I moved out to San Francisco, I was at the San Francisco, what's it called? San Francisco State University, go Gators, right? <laughs> and studied photography there as well. And then eventually moved over to industrial design. I adore black and white photography. Um, it's what I learned doing and continued doing because photojournalism was standard in black and white in the, at the time. Plus, it's a really forgiving media. It's a lot more flexible, and uh, specifically, I could do all of the work myself. I could process all the film. I could do all of the printing in a, a little makeshift dark room I had under the stairs where I lived. So it made it really cost effective, and I love black and white. And also at the time, uh, Andy Warhol's interview magazine was hugely popular and it was just full of gorgeous black and white photographs. Uh, the media was really having a second heyday. Uh, this was all generated through working with the Sentinel newspaper and my cohort, Mike Everett, um, he was in charge of selling ads and he really knew a lot of people. He knew all the club promoters. So he would sort of find out where all the, the happening spots were and he kind of had a mental list of we're going to go to this club first and then we're going to go over to this one. And so in a given night we might go to three or four locations. And uh, it was such a good time because we were kind of treated like royalty. We'd get to go to the front of the line and we were always given a few drink tickets, which was nice. And, uh, you know, after a while we were kind of known for uh, this kind of work and people were responding so positively that they would come to us like, hey, take our picture, we want to be in the newspaper. It made a lot of fun. Quite a few of them did make it into the Sentinel. It was uh, a little photo essay called Hot Shots. And so if you look through any of the old papers, you can often find like, oh yeah, I remember. <laughs>
Most of them are captioned and we did try to uh, identify who the people were, not always successfully, and also which clubs that they were taken in. Nightclubs are, you know, at the time, I guess it was considered a public space. Uh, we did definitely ask people's permission and if they said no, we absolutely respected that. Well, I think um, the end up, which was, is a bar and it's still around, was incredibly prolific for hosting a variety of pretty wild themed nights. There was Uranus and, and Mark Helmy. Decadence. Decadence. And, um, Act Fridays eventually and a lot of more, yeah. Yeah, so that was one of the real hubs in the south of Market area where a lot of these pictures were taken. And just, it kind of became um, a magnet for incredibly creative self-expression and sort of this super edgy theater slash drag. Um, it was really a, a wonderful place for this type of person to express themselves. I absolutely had to rely on flash and the clubs were extremely dark and you know I, I was pushing the limits of the film and the equipment itself just you know nothing was automatic at the time it was all manual focus so it's kind of amazing that any of these are in focus at all <laughs> but it worked out the flash helped and you know it might have been a little bit annoying but you know, there were a lot of strobe lights and other kind of artificial lights happening as well, flashing. You know, these, these three gentlemen are obviously really enjoying each other's company. And what, what I also like about it is, you know, in the middle we have a sister of perpetual indulgence, which was kind of new at the time, an organization that I believe was started to react and uh, raise money for AIDS and it's still going strong, doing so much philanthropy, it's really impressive. And I just love the way this guy um, <laughs> chose to trim his mustache on one side, he's got this sort of Salvador Dali thing going on on the other side, he's like, I'm just gonna cut that off. And, uh, you know, just a creative, happy little scene. But then on somber note, at the opening, I found out that, um, those two gentlemen didn't make it. I think that's what's um, interesting about this show is it is such a contrast to what was happening everywhere else. So this was sort of the, you know, obviously there's imp this image, which I do really like because it is surrounded by this jovial, hedonistic, awesome, creative lifestyle. But yet at the same time, every one of us was aware of what was happening, was being affected by it. I really don't think denial was possible at this point. Um, certainly the need to escape the tragedy and, and, you know, a lot of these people were in their 20s, so you have sort of the effervescence of youth on your side and biological urges, you know, <laughs> so you've gotta be able to enjoy life even while there's so much negativity going on. I started working at the Sentinel probably, God, 86, and then worked there doing a lot of different events, then pairing up with Mike to get to do this whole series, and eventually um, getting kicked to the curb because he started, uh, he left the Sentinel and started his own publication called Odyssey, which was covering a lot of nightlife, pretty much all nightlife stuff. And he got a digital camera and he's like, I don't really need you anymore. I can do this on my own. So that was the end of my nightlife photography work. I do, uh, I do love digital photography because it's so easy. Uh, it's hard to resist, and I do not miss being around all the chemicals. So the exhibit has like a two or three wonderful overall theses um, besides enjoying the beautiful art that Melissa captured of the time. Um, what we're hoping that people take away is an experience um, of 
people being out and happy for the camera and for the press for one of the first times in history. Um, the period before this, um, it was very, was still, it was very ruinous if you appeared in the press as an openly gay person. Uh, cameras were not encouraged in bars. Um, that's why bars were deliberately low lit and blacking their windows. This was a period AIDS and political activism had made coming out of the closet not only a necessity but a normal thing to do. Um, so these were people who were actually hungry for the spotlight in the clubs for the first time, who were looking for Melissa, who was really the only club photographer at the time, so that they could get their picture taken and very excited to see their own pictures in the paper the next, uh, you know, the next week, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this was obviously before the advent of digital cameras when it became easier to take a picture in the club. So this was a really rare moment where media hunger was meeting the technology hadn't caught up yet. So this is a really good glimpse into that time um, then. Uh, another thing that we wanted to kind of impress upon people is that there was very much living in the moment at that time because of the AIDS crisis. Um, partying was mixed with activism. Uh, the first thing you saw when you went into a club would be a poster for the latest protest that was coming up. You'd see a bowl of these multicolored condoms that you were encouraged to take. Drag queens were passing out safe sex kits. Um, so there was that interwoven with everything that was going on at the time. So, um, and, and also I think young people today kind of look back at that era, the AIDS era, and just wonder if it was just horrible moping trauma, uh, you know, just constant drama. And I feel that there was that, of course, but we want to also show that people were being incredibly creative. They were seizing the moment because they didn't know if they would die tomorrow. They were being artists, they were being musicians, they were being fashion designers, something you can't move to San Francisco and be anymore, really, because it's so expensive. So this was really a rare moment when you could be as creative as you wanted it was just unfortunately shadowed by an epidemic that was taking your friends every week. So it was a really magical time. I mean, it was a magical and historic time, as well as a traumatic time. And so we wanted to bring out kind of the more positive aspect of that. The bathhouses were closed in around uh, 88, 86, 88, and then, um, uh, but the, there were still these all night clubs, and that was another thing. Nightlife was different here then because clubs went all night. Uh, now every place closes at two, and you have to have a special after hours, but these were people partying into the next morning. Um, and this was their meeting space. This was how they shared news before the internet. This is how you heard about the latest medical discoveries. If you were new in town, you didn't have to find a place to sleep because you could be at the club all night and probably be taken home by somebody. <laughs> so these were like clubs were the epicenters of community news and socialization back then before the internet. I mean, there were still breakdowns, but there were still crackdowns, but it really wasn't until the, re the rave era of 1994, around that era, when the ABC was specifically tasked with um, closing uh, clubs down, nightclubs down, because they were afraid of unsafe warehouses, etc. At least that was, the, that was the given reason. So these clubs were allowed to operate in peace pretty much through that period. Um, you know, there wasn't exactly a... I think people just didn't know what clubs were, whereas they could hear bathhouses and think, sex. You know, this was like, oh my god, drag queens, what is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> as well as Melissa's um, wonderful photographs that we have framed here, we also compiled um, about 90 more of her photos um, that appear in our, many of which appear in our catalog that are from the same period, as well as newspaper layouts from the Sentinel that you can see, and a couple of um, instances of footage from the GLBT Historical Society archives of dance clubs from that time, kind of a bookend. We have one from 1986 and one from 1996, so you can see what was happening in between with Melissa's photos. We also have some ephemera here in a case um, that includes uh, things like ACT UP as stickers, Keith hearing buttons, um, safe sex kits, flyers for the clubs of the time, t-shirts, um, just kind of like what we've got from the, in the archives that are from that time and represent the activism meets the club aspect. I uh, really wanted to thank the museum and the GLBT Historical Society for this opportunity and working with Marky as my co-curator. It's just been wonderful and I really want to urge everyone that I meet to become a member to support this organization and you know we really have to understand that without this kind of organization the history is lost.
because no other organization is going to keep it and maintain it and promote it.